Hey, I want to welcome you as well. Uh, go ahead and grab your Bible. If you're watching this online, we are so glad that you're here. I just want to welcome you personally. Uh, grab your Bible and uh, follow along with us. We're so glad that you've joined us. In fact, we have another QR code you can use. It's on the screen. You can uh, see it there. You can pull out your phone and just... Um, uh, you can get some great study uh, questions. Uh, many are using this for small groups and devotional guides. So it's out on our website, whether you grab that now. Uh, think about it later. Maybe it's tomorrow morning, Tuesday morning, every morning to walk through uh, what, we're, what we're learning each Sunday as we look at the fruit of the Spirit. And we're so glad that you've joined us today. I got a question for you. I want to ask you, um, it's be interesting to have this conversation, I think, if we had time, but what is the most underrated uh, movie of all time? What would that be for you? Or how about the most underrated book that, that, you, know, that you just love, but maybe people don't know a lot about? Most underrated athlete of all time, underrated football player, the most underrated taco joint in Dallas. That would be a good one. Most underrated burger place. Now, to be underrated would mean that, you know, you think it's awesome or it is amazing, but people just don't know about it. It needs to be lifted up. And today we're going to talk about what I believe is the most underrated fruit of the spirit of all of them. If you've not been with us, we've been walking through what's called the fruit of the spirit. It's in Galatians chapter five. You can turn there. Galatians five. Verses 22 and 23. In fact, we'll put it on the screen and we'll all say this together. This is our kind of memory theme verse, two verses, for this entire series of messages. Let's say it together and you at home, say it with us. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now that little tag at the end, I love because he's saying, hey, there's no, there's no parameters around this. There's no debate. There's no rules around this. There's, there's no, how about this? There's no mask. There's no restrictions. There's just freedom is what he's saying. There's no law in this. This is the way that those of us who trust in Christ live. We live with this expression, this fruit of the spirit. Now you might take a guess if you've been here with us, which one you think is most underrated of all of them? It's what we've thought about already in our time of worship. The word gentleness here is the word prautes. Praus in the Greek is the word gentle. Gentleness, prautes, is a word that, that means gentle. It means praus. It means meek. You probably know that word in the King James. It's, it's, it's translated meek. Meekness is underrated in our world, but as we'll see today, is not underrated in the kingdom of God. Not one bit. And so each week we've applied a certain fruit uh, to each one. I don't know if you've been with us, but what we've done, we've tried to say, hey, when we see this particular fruit, like a real fruit that, that connects with the fruit of the spirit, when we see it, we'll remember and go, oh yes, I need to practice that. And I remember why it was that perhaps. If you've been with us, you might remember love was the watermelon. Little teeny seed, but giant, the biggest fruit of them all. Love, joy, joy, we said was oranges. It might just splash all over you. Jo love, joy, peace. Peace is easy because it's the peach. Just one, one letter in, the, in English, just peach. It's, it's soft on the outside, but it's rock hard on the inside, regardless of what comes its way. Love, joy, peace, patience was the pineapple. Goodness was the apple. Do you remember that? Faithfulness last week was the banana. This week, we're talking about gentleness. I've chosen the, the avocado now. This is a strange fruit, maybe among all of them. This one probably is the most underrated of them all. In fact, we, we did a little research where, where you could check to see, you know, how popular are these fruits? And there's actually a thing, a ranking, you can go to World Atlas, and, and it's based on production of um, metric tons. Of all the fruit that we're looking at, in this series of messages, the avocado ranks last. The poor avocado. But it grows in warm places, comes from a warm, warm place. You know, I don't know my way around the produce section of the grocery store too well. I do a pretty good job, but I know how to pick an avocado. 
right? It, it, it's got to be soft, but not too soft. It's got to be ripe. This one's, this one's just about ready, I think. There's probably another one here that might be. This one's probably spot on, even though all of them will tell you that they're ripe by me, by me. But you've got to check all of them. It's always a little soft. They come from a, from a soft place. You can remember that, a soft heart. Comes from a warm and caring place. And, and so what you may not know is that the avocado, though ranking last among the fruit that we're looking at, it is the super fruit. You may not know that of all the fruit, it's the highest in protein, the highest in fiber. It, it even has the healthy fats. You might know that. We're all looking for healthy fat, right? It, it has healthy fats, potassium, magnesium. It's known as the super fruit. It can reduce cholesterol levels. It, it can reduce high blood pressure. It, it can even help you with arthritis. Some of y'all are going to go buy some, uh, uh, buy some avocados today. And who doesn't like some guacamole, right? Or some avocado toast. But it's the most underrated, I think, of all the fruit we find in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But I would argue it might be the most needed fruit in our day. The Dutch reformer, his name was George Bethune. He said this about gentleness. Perhaps no grace is less prayed for or less cultivated than gentleness. When's the last time you prayed for the Lord to make you gentle, to allow you to become more gentle? Could it be that it's underrated because it's, most, it's the most misunderstood? Most people equate gentleness, being gentle or meek with weakness, we think, well, meek is weak, someone who doesn't stand up for themselves. But when we look at scripture, we see something entirely different. And this is what I want you to see today. This has been my hope and prayer. Again, the Greek word proutes is a word that really means, this is our working definition. Biblical definition is this. Gentleness is strength under control. It was a word that was used to describe a horse that had been tamed. Imagine a, a thousand pound stallion being tamed for, for, for good use. It's power under control. This is what meekness is. In fact, I would argue that, it just hit me this week, you would have to have strength and power in order to be gentle. I mean, would you say that a little, little baby lamb is gentle? I, I guess so. A little baby chick, oh, he's so gentle. Or a little puppy or a kitten. I think you're more likely to say around a big puppy, big dog, around a small, hey, be, be gentle. You've got power here. Or how about an older brother meeting his little newborn baby sister? Be gentle. Be gentle. Because your strength, you see that the gentleness is power under control. And I want you to see that. Today, as we think about this super fruit, maybe there's no more relevant fruit for us to display in our lives in these days than gentleness. So how can we help lift it up? How can we keep it not underrated in our lives? How can we exalt it, raise it up? We need three things is what I want to look at today. We need, we need the embrace of gentleness. I want us to embrace, to grasp gentleness. We need a standard of gentleness. We're going to look at the standard of gentleness and then we need a response to gentleness. You know, as believers, as followers of Jesus, um, we've noted that all of these fruit uh, are, are, are a part of an expression of, of, of a life, the spirit at work in our hearts and our lives. It's not a pick and choose. This is not even like today. It's not, well, I'll be gentle if it's convenient for me. Um, I'll, be, I'll be patient every now and then. This is an all out embrace. This is the Christian life. And so today you might think, that, well, this, you know, gentleness, that's just not me. I mean, I'm just kind of, I, I don't have that personality. This is not a personality type. This is not an Enneagram type. It, it's not a certain demeanor or temperament. Gentleness is what we've all been called to. Every single one of us, if we're going to be and live like Jesus. So first, let's talk about this need to embrace Gentleness, the embrace of gentleness. This entire season, we've been uh, kind of referencing at times Proverbs 15, 1, that says a gentle answer, a soft, gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. In the Greek Septuagint, I was curious, the Greek translation of the, of the Hebrew of this passage in the Old Testament, it says this, anger slays even wise men, yet a submissive answer turns away wrath. How relevant is this 
in our day. You know, the election may be over, but there are a lot of opportunities for us to engage in dialogue with people that we might disagree with and, and be able to show this fruit of gentleness. It's so needed in our day. And, and, and I would like to make this point. I think it's clear. Gentleness is what will separate us from the rest of the world. Gentleness, I think, is our superpower. We said kindness is our super. This is the super fruit. We shine brightly when we're gentle. Don't miss this. Jonathan Edwards, who's arguably one of the most brilliant theologians who's ever lived, he taught that gentleness is what he called a lamb-like, dove-like spirit. And it's not an option. It's not an optional extra for the believer. He said this, gentleness is the true and distinguishing disposition of the hearts of Christians. He's saying, in other words, gentleness is the most Christian way to be. When you think about Jesus, you think about the fact that he is gentle. He's self-identified as gentle, meek, and lowly. And let's be honest, it's hard to embrace gentleness with people that you disagree with, a people that, you know, or maybe, maybe you're, you're outraged with them. Are they with you? It's hard to be gentle. Maybe they have certain political, again, issues or perspectives. Maybe people, you just, just the people you know, just it's hard for you to be gentle. We need to embrace, embrace gentleness. I want you to see today, again, it's not, it's not that our behavior towards people changes. What I want you to see today is our devotion towards them changes. Our devotion to other people will actually change as we seek, not simply to be gentle, or how about this, to do gentleness, to act gently, but to, to become gentle. And that's a different level of gentleness altogether that I want us to see today. Because our, our goal in our dialogue and conversations, whether it's in your personal life, your marriage, or your family, the goal is not always to win an argument. The goal is to win people to Jesus or to win before him, to glorify him in the way that you respond. Some of you know, I did my, my doctoral work in the area of apologetics. Uh, the Greek word apologia, it means to give an answer or defense. We find it in 1 Peter chapter 3.15. You can see it there. It says, but in your hearts, in fact, this is our memory verse for this week, okay, coming up. So this is a longer one than we've had. In fact, let's all say it together first time out. Let's say this together. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. That word or that phrase to make a defense is the word apologia, apologetics. It's to give a defense. It was a courtroom term. It really simply means translated to, to respond back, to give an answer. And, 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 and he says, I love how Peter says this bold, passionate Peter says, yet yeah, do it with gentleness, proud taste and respect. I want you to pause for a minute and think about someone you know who is gentle. Let them be kind of a picture for you. Someone who's gentle and kind. Who would that be? You know, I've thought about that this week and it, it was easy for me. I, my wife, Stacy, is gentle. How cool is that? I get to live with like the most gentle person I think I know. My mom is gentle. My mother-in-law, some of you know, is gentle. But I know a lot of men who are gentle. I know a lot of men in our church who are gentle. I know a lot of deacon leadership, lay leaders. I know a lot of men who are gentle. See, it's not just a, a quiet and gentle spirit of a woman. In fact, we're all called, again, to be gentle. How about that? To be a gentleman. A lost aspiration in our culture today. I would challenge all of us men. We are called to be gentle men because it's a fruit of the spirit. You see, that we're to live out and, and sometimes, you know, it's, it, it is that quiet and sweet demeanor, but because it's how we respond to people, uh, difficult people in difficult situations that makes the difference, right? Guiding young Timothy and pastors like me, Paul says this in 2 Timothy chapter two. He says, and the Lord's servant, 
and this applies to all of us, must not be quarrelsome. He's talking to Timothy and to pastors. He says, but kind to everyone. Now think about this. I read this years ago. As a pastor, I can't be quarrelsome with anyone. I'm not allowed to be that way. And you might say, well, Jeff, that kind of puts you, you know, at a disadvantage, doesn't it? I used to think so. Not anymore. But be kind, it says, to everyone. Able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. There it is, prautes. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. You see the end game? The end game is not to win an argument, but to win people to Jesus. That's the entire point here. Let me ask you, when was the last time your gentleness led someone to repentance and reconciliation? Maybe in your relationship. When's the last time that your gentle response led someone to reconcile with you? When's the last time you prayed for someone that you struggle with? Friends, listen, gentleness is our superpower if we have faith to believe it. And it's what Jesus is teaching us today. Author and pastor Ray Ortland, he said this, to the degree that we have renounced uh, pushiness and embraced gentleness, we are making the real Jesus visible in our world today. And then he says, which is success. No matter what else might happen to us. You see, my point here is that gentleness must be embraced because it must be a part of us, not simply spurts here and there, not you know, when it's convenient for us or advantageous. Embracing gentleness is not about behavior modification, it's, it's about devoting ourselves to one another and devoting ourselves more deeply to Jesus. Embracing gentleness means that we embrace, we come near to Jesus. And not just doing gentle things again, but becoming gentle. Becoming like him. As Christians, we embrace a life of gentleness as we draw near to Jesus. It's possible for you to become more gentle and all of us need to be more gentle. So we see this embrace of gentleness as we embrace Jesus and his life in us. And we see the standard of gentleness as well. He becomes now then the standard of gentleness. When we think about gentleness, we think about certain people that we know, but we should think about Jesus who is the perfect standard. And I could have gone to a hundred moments in his life, but I want to go to John, John 13. If you'll turn to John 13 in your Bible, I'm going to go to John 13 because here we have a picture and then Uh, I want us to to look at this for a moment and apply it to our lives. This is the radical gentleness of Jesus. John 13, he's with his disciples one last time. You you might know this this story. He's in the upper room. He's about to be uh, arrested, trumped up charges through the night. He will be beaten almost to the point of death the next morning. He will die on a cross through the day. He will die in the afternoon on Friday. But here, he is with his disciples one last time. Jesus, think about it, the most powerful man in the room, given all authority, is about to do the most backwards thing a teacher, a master, one in authority could do. And we'll see the greatest leadership moment and ministry of his life in terms of teaching us how to be imitators. He says this, beginning with verse three, Jesus, knowing that the father had given all things into his hands. Okay, so knowing that he'd been given all authority, he finished the work that he was due. He's about to go back, like it says, and had come from the father going back to God. Okay, something big is about to happen here. Something huge is about to happen. And it says then that he rose from supper, laid aside his outer garments, And taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. So picture this. He looks like a slave boy. He then poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Friends, this portrayal of Jesus shows us a further understanding of this word prous, gentleness. Gentle is also translated not being overly impressed by the, a sense of one's self-importance. 
So Jesus not only shows mercy, but he's also showing humility. Two traits that go together in a person who is gentle. Someone who's gentle doesn't have a, an overly, you know, extended view of themselves, putting others now before their own needs. One of the simple ways you can apply this message today is to simply put someone else's needs ahead of yours. That's a gentle response. So the most powerful person in the room stoops down. And here's what's ironic in Luke chapter 22, the same story. Luke's version says that the uh, disciples had been debating over who's the greatest. And then Jesus shows them who is the greatest. Just quiets everyone in the room. What a stark contrast to what we think leadership is in our world today. It's not, it's not a person who's overly impressed with themselves. Jesus, the servant leader, shows us that true servant leadership is being gentle with others. It's not the loudest person in the room. It, it's not the most confident even, the strongest, the, the, the most dynamic person in the room perhaps. The one who's talking more than anybody else, forcing his or her way, powering up on everybody else. Jesus says that's not leadership. Leadership looks like a servant who's washing the feet of everyone else. This idea of being impressed with one's uh, you know, self-importance is of course what Jesus talked about constantly, pushed against. And it's coincidentally what I think, one of the reasons why non-Christians are turned off to Christians in our day. According to a recent poll, it was actually 2019, Barna Group survey says this, uh, 47% of millennials agree, look at this, it is wrong to share one's personal beliefs with someone of a different faith in hopes that they will one day share the same faith. And yet we're called to share the gospel. In an, an incredible book by Scott Sauls, a great book on this topic called A Gentle Answer, he responds to this, this research by saying this, he writes this, a reason for the shift from favor to disfavor towards Christians is that many people today perceive that Christians lack humility, approachability, and empathy. Ask the average skeptic, Gnostic, or atheist at a conversation with one this morning. And I believe this is true. He says this, what they think Christianity stands for, and he or she will likely respond by saying that Christianity is about being right, acting superior in your rightness, and even injuring people with your rightness. The kind of gentleness that Jesus displays upon washing the disciples' feet is a different kind of gentleness. It's this gentleness that would not condemn the woman caught in adultery. It's this gentleness that would invite himself to Zacchaeus' house, the hated tax collector. It was this gentleness that gave him the label from religious leaders, you're a friend of sinners, and Jesus would wear that like a badge of honor. He was gentle towards everyone. Not only is this different, this is countercultural, and it's why it causes us to to stand out. In fact, later in verse 15 of that same story, he says this, for I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Now you be gentle. He's saying this, I've been gentle to you, you be gentle to one another. And I'm so grateful that our church is so marked by gentleness. I said that to our team this morning. Our staff is marked by gentleness and I'm grateful. Jesus is our standard in a world that glorifies self-importance and power and strength and winning an argument. And so now I wanna close with this. We, we talked about the embrace of gentleness, the standard of gentleness is Jesus, but we must now enter into a response to gentleness. And, and what I mean here is, is we won't know Christ's gentleness until we've experienced his life and his ministry in, in our lives. In Matthew 11, uh, verse 28 through 30, it says this, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is a passage we've looked at a lot during the pandemic. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle, there it is, prous, and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Notice Jesus says, you come to me. Gentleness is not found in a concept, 
Again, not a personality type. It's found in an encounter with Jesus. And I think what he's saying here is not simply when you need me, you come. Or I'll give you some gentleness if you need to come. You need, to, you need someone to be gentle. I'll be gentle with you. You come to. I think he's saying more so, this is who I am. And I'm always gentle toward you. And so friends, look, think about it. If gentleness is strength under control, here's how I want us to land this and then pray. Each one of us praying and, and online, praying in our own lives. Gentleness demands surrender, right? The thousand pound stallion needs to surrender its will to the trainer, to the master, to the rider so it can be put to good use. And like you and I, we have to surrender our will. Gentleness is choosing surrender over muscling up our own desires to make it through difficulties. It's as if to say, um, the Lord is telling us today, he may be saying to you, going through one of the hardest times in your life perhaps, he's saying, I know that you could do something about this, but would you let me do something instead? See, gentleness is an act of faith. This is why this week, perhaps, you know, here's what I've learned. When I enter into a difficult situation or maybe a difficult decision or it's going to be a hard conversation, when I enter into those times, I no longer pray, Lord, help me to make my, make my case. Help me to, and I think the apology, help me to be right. Let me help. They, I so hope they see my side of this thing because I, I believe I'm right. I'm seeking your will. I, I no longer pray that way. And it's so freeing. Lord, help me to be gentle. Help me to be humble. Help me to learn and to grow. Help me to be like you. And if I'm right and not proven right, may they see you. That's the win. And so friends, as we leave this, this place and this time, this moment, I want us to close with prayer. I want us to enter into a time of prayer because what I want you to see here is that Jesus is calling us to surrender our lives to him because he's the one who's gentle to us. He says in Luke 9, 23, he says this. He said to all, he's saying to all of us, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. You see what he's saying? Surrender your will to him. And friend, if you're watching online or maybe you're here today, you've never received Christ. As I was able to share with a, a woman today who's here for the first time after our, our early service, Jesus has come to bridge the gap between you and a holy God. He's come to change your heart. He died on the cross for you, gave his will over to the Father so that he might take on your sin, my sin, our shame, that he would die a death so we wouldn't have to die. And he was raised again so that we might have life in him. And so, friends, I want us to pray together. Would you just bow your heads and close your eyes right now? And if I can pray over you, if you want prayer today, if you need gentleness in your life, if you just say, Pastor, would you pray over me? I want you to just put your, put your hand over your heart right now, just right where you are, right here in this room or wherever you may find yourself right now. Say, I need prayer today. I want to give my life, my heart, this heart more fully over to Jesus. Maybe you for the first time. Just say, Lord, make me more gentle. Make me more like you. Lord, I pray that you would, you would now convict every one of us that we'd surrender our will to you. Whatever that means for us today. That we would think about people maybe that are in our lives that we need to be more gentle uh, with make us gentle people and friend if you've never asked Christ in your heart just say Lord come into my heart right now thank you for dying on the cross for me I give you my life Lord we love you Jesus we embrace your gentleness the standard for our lives and we respond to it to live like you this week in your name we pray, amen.